what's your experience with insects? Do you enjoy butterflies? Have you been stung by a bee or bitten by a mosquito? Regardless of whether you like these animals or feel squeamish about them, they are part of the most abundant and diverse group on Earth, arthropods. But how did this group of animals become masters of survival? Today our guest, Dan Babbitt, has hissing cockroaches, giant spiders, and other fascinating bugs for us to explore their secrets. Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Maggie Benson, host of Live from Curious, Smithsonian Science How. We have a really fun show today where we're going to look at insect adaptations and see special features on these insects that have made them masters of survival. Before we get started and get to our guest, I want to ask you a question. You can respond using the window that appears to the right of your video screen. So how can so many different kinds of insects be masters of survival? By getting along with each other, by occupying different niches, by not competing with each other, or by sharing food. You can take a moment to think about this and put your answer in the window to the right. All right, while you're thinking about that, we're gonna go to our special guest, Dan Babbitt, who's manager of the Insect Zoo and Butterfly Pavilion here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Thanks for joining us today, Dan. Yeah, happy to be here. So we're getting a lot of responses back, and the majority Excellent. think that by occupying different niches, insects are able to be masters of survival. What do you think about that? Yeah, we have a smart group out there. That's uh, totally true. So insects are great at adapting into different um, niches or areas within the ecosystem. And so they're utilizing different resources and different spaces within, the, within that ecosystem. Interesting. So if they're sharing resources and spaces, that's kind of like when I was growing up and my sister and I had to share a room. We had to share our space, our clothes, maybe even sometimes our meals. Is that something that's kind of similar? Yeah. So if you divide up your room and one sister is living in one and your sister is living one side and you were living on the other side and you're maybe sharing your food like you would eat the peas and she would eat the mashed potatoes mm -hmm. and that's so you could both, you both survive and uh, flourish. So that could be called something like a niche. Yeah. Wonderful. So these insects are surviving because they live in so many different niches. Exactly. So can you show us an example here today? We have a lot of amazing insects it looks like. Yeah. Can you show us one that has its own special niche? Yeah, sure. Let's take a look at this guy first. One of our... Wow, is that real? It is. He looks like he's made out of plastic or a wind-up toy, but this is a real big bug. He's beautiful. What is it? So this is an atlas beetle from Southeast Asia. And you can see, there we go. You can see he's an insect because he has six legs, three on this side and three on this side. That's one of the major characteristics of insects. What else makes an insect an insect? Um, insects, you're going to find they have jointed legs and they have a exoskeleton. So they have a skeleton not on the inside like vertebrates do, but on the outside. And what kind of family is this part of? Like I know as a human, I'm a mammal. This is a group of uh, animals that are arthropods. And so insects are part of that group, but also you'll find centipedes, millipedes, you'll have crustaceans and arachnids. So what you're saying are like spiders and crabs, they're arthropods, but they're not necessarily insects. No, they're not, not all, all insects are arthropods, but not all arthropods are insects. And what they share, as you'll see here, I can even bring out a different arthropod here. You can see it's on the table, there we go. So we have an example of the crustaceans there. This is a Halloween crab from Central America. And so they both have that hard exoskeleton on the outside, and they both, both have jointed legs, and they're both symmetrical on either side of their body. So they look the same on one side as they do on the other. But if we count legs, we'll see that this is, has 10 and this has 6. So that is one of the differences between the groups. So I guess a rule of thumb when trying to decide what kind of arthropod you have, you count the legs. It's a good place to start. Cool. So let's learn about the niche of this atlas beetle. All right, so this is the adult of the beetle, and he lives on fruit and sap, so likes things that are sweet. And so he's going to be up in the tree. If there's flowing sap in the tree, he might find a good spot and be able to feed on that. One thing that is really neat with this species is that their young form, their larval form, is going to be eating something in a different part of that forest ecosystem. So this is a different species, but this is a 
a larva of another scare beetle, Megalosoma, which is wow, from it's South America. Huge. Yeah, he's quite massive. And so this is what this guy looked like when he was little. And so these are living in rotten logs on the forest floor where the adult is eating sap and fruit in the, for, in the canopy or in the trees. So really different life stages aren't actually competing or living in the same habitats at all. Right, so with a lot of, oh, with a lot of insects, especially ones that go through complete metamorphosis where they have an egg, larva, pupa, and adult stage, they aren't competing with their, with their young. So you said that these um, beetles are from uh, the forest, but what kind of forest? Yeah, so this is from the, uh, a tropical forest in Southeast Asia. And this one is from the rainforest, tropical rainforest of South America. So if these are tropical species, mm -hmm. why do we have them here at our insect zoo at the Smithsonian? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, the, in, the Smithsonian is a bit bug crazy. We have about 35 million specimens in our research collection. Wow. So behind the scenes in the museum that we have active research going on and that we share with, with other researchers around the world. And so we want to show a bit of what's going on behind the scenes to our public. And a great way to do that is with our live insect collection. That's incredible. 35 million. Yeah. Wow, that's huge. So I can imagine that caring for them um, is a big task. How do you care for all of these? It is a big task. It's hard to have a tropical environment in, in well, even though D.C. feels like tropical sometimes. Today it doesn't. It's quite cold. And so it's hard to have a tropical environment inside of a building. Um, and we have about 70 different species of arthropods that we have in the exhibit, plus the butterfly pavilion, which is a whole other ecosystem we have to recreate. And so we have to make sure we have to know about the natural history of all of our, all of our arthropods and know what they need from temperature, humidity, and food, and we can recreate that for them. And so you mentioned the butterfly pavilion and the insect zoo. Mm -hmm. A big component of this is allowing our visitors to be able to see these insects. Is that right? It is. So we want to get people first-hand experience from insects they might encounter in their own backyard, but also from around the world. And what does that do? Does it give a better appreciation or just a better knowledge of what's out there? It does. Um, insects can get a bad rap. So people, um, there's a lot of things about insects being gross and scary. Um, <laughs> so getting, learning more about it and the important role they have in our environment, we think is, a, is vital. And so it gives them con better connected to their natural world. Cool. We already have a student question. Are you ready to take yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. So this one comes from Traeger Middle School. Okay. Thanks for joining us again, Traeger. And they want to know, what's the most common color of insects? That's a great question. Um, are you going to be finding insects that are blending into the environment? So there's going to be a lot of green insects that are trying green and brown. They're blending into the natural environment. But you're also going to find insects that are ranging in color from red to even blue. Cool. So yeah. these are all ad adaptations, right? Right. So depending on the environment they live and what has been most successful. So Dan from Alberta has a question. And Dan wants to know, is it hard to keep insects alive? It can be a challenge, Dan, but that's, what our, that's our job here. Um, so you have to know a lot about them. So you work with colleagues or your colleagues around the country, and we do, we do studies here, and we keep charts. And we record all the information that we, um, that we take by when we care for the animals so we know what works and what doesn't work so we can pass that information on. So I feel like you've given us a really great overview of what happens in the insect zoo and how you care for all these animals with different adaptations. Yeah. Let's start looking at an adaptation. Um, I hear that you have some cockroaches. I do. Here, let's get it. Let's take a look at those. Let me put this guy back in his case here. He has powerful legs. He does. He has very strong legs because what he's doing, he can hang on to a branch and battle other males. So he needs really strong legs to be able to do that. All right. Wow, these are big roaches. <sighs> here, I'm going to let you hold one, Maggie. Yeah. You can put one down here. So these are famous in the insect zoo. Once a lot of our visitors might have seen in movies or when they're visiting other insect zoos in their area. So these are the Madagascar hissing cockroaches. How do they get that name? Because they can hiss. Really? So unlike most other insects that make noise, they'll make noise by rubbing parts of their body together. So it's called stridulation. So the like a cricket will rub its wings together to sing. These guys don't do that. They push air out of these holes in their abdomen, and that can make a hissing noise. And that's the same holes they use to breathe. So insects breathe not from their mouth, but from holes in their abdomen. So it might be like the same sound that might come out from a human 
pushing right. air through their nose. It's just theirs is going through their abdomen. Right, it's more similar to what vertebrates do than what um, insects and other arthropods do. And they can make three distinct noises. The males can. The males make a noise when they're defensive. So if you grab them, they feel like they're being threatened, they'll make a noise. They'll make a noise when they're trying to, um, they're trying to mate, so to attract females. And they'll make a, a different noise when they're, trying, when they're battling other males. So they must be happy right now because they're very quiet. They are very quiet, yeah. <laughs> we treat That's our, a we good treat our, sign. We treat our roach as well. Yeah. <laughs> they're happy. <laughs> cool. Why don't you show us something else? Sure. I hope those aren't the kinds of roaches that people have in their houses either. They are not. So most roaches and most insects don't do well in houses. So it's too dry and there's not enough, not enough food or water. And so some, some have adapted very well to living in houses, but most, most insects don't. And so most roaches you're going to find on forest floors or wood, woodland floors. All right. Wow, that's beautiful. That's a big spider. It is a big spider. <laughs> So, big spiders, so what is this? <laughs> so big spiders can make some people nervous. So this is a very nice spider. This is a... It has a, a beautiful pink hue to it. She <laughs> is. It's a Chilean rosehair tarantula, which is the tarantulas are some of the larger spiders. And they can get even bigger than this. We have up in the insect zoo, we have a bird-eating tarantula that can be the size of a dinner plate. Um, but she is uh, one of the... She's, this is about an average size for most tarantulas. And you can see with the spider, we're talking about legs. So she has eight legs. Four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then her two main body parts there. So I think a lot of people have a lot of fears around spiders, mm -hmm. and maybe even especially tarantulas because yeah, they're so large. So we actually have a question for our students where we want to ask you, how does a tarantula defend itself? Does it run away, rear up to look bigger, flick irritating hairs, or does it bite? Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window to the right of the video. Okay, Dan, so while the students are thinking about their answers, sure. can you give us some hints? Some hints for that? So I'm holding this tarantula and this tarantula is not biting me. I know, it looks very nice. It is spinning a little bit of a web. It is. So you can see coming out here, they have spinnerets on the back of the spider, and she's spinning a web that you can see coming out right now. And oh, they don't use that incredible. to catch their prey, but they'll line their burrow. This is a ground-dwelling tarantula, and so she'll line her burrow with this webbing. Wow. So we have a lot of split answers. We sure. have run away, flick irritating hair, rearing up, but nobody's answering bites. What do you say? Oh, that's good. That's good. That means we're getting our message out about spiders. So these guys, they, 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 biting is one of the last resorts. So what if they're feeling threatened, what they're going to do is run away. They just want to get out of the bad situation, um, away from a predator or a dangerous place. Um, the next step, if that's not working, tarantulas from the Americas might flick hairs. So they have specialized hairs on their abdomen that they'll flick off that uh, can be irritating. So they can get in the eyes of a predator, and it can hurt. Um, and so give them time to get away. Now, is that like the normal hair that we have in our head? No, it's, a, it's the same makeup as the rest of their body. So it's a chitinous material. And it's, it's specialized, so it causes that irritation. Like an exoskeleton. It is. It's part of their exoskeleton. Exactly right. Um, and if that's not working, what they will do is they'll rear up on their back legs and look as big as possible and uh, show their fangs. And that might be enough to scare a predator away. Sometimes it's enough to scare us away if we're working with the tarantulas. Um, and if all else fails and something is grabbing it and squeezing it and hurting it, it might bite to try to get that thing to let go and let them get away. Cool. So I feel really comfortable now with the tarantulas that and other spiders that biting is their last resort. It is. So it's very hard to get bitten by a spider. So they get a bad rap. So um, I see another spider here. Oh, all right. Um, what's that? So this is our pink toe tarantula. So this is another type of tarantula, but where this tarantula lives on the ground, it lives in a burrow, and it'll hunt by waiting for bugs to walk across above it, and it'll run out and grab it. These guys can even wait a year between meals, so they can sit and wait a long time. Wow. But this is a pink toe tarantula up here. And, and it actually has pink toes. It does have pink toes. <laughs> <laughs> and she, uh, here, I can get her to move down a little bit. 
and I'm leaving her in the case, not because she's dangerous, but she's really quick. She's adapted to live in the trees. Where most tarantulas live on the ground, she's a really good climber, and you take her out, she'll want to climb up and be up on my head and jump off and <laughs> run away. Um, so we'll leave her in the case. And so they can, they can climb up high, and they can fall. They can even drop from high heights of a tree and float down, where this tarantula, if I were to drop it, it might get seriously injured if I dropped it just from a few feet off the ground. Where this one can fall from the height of a tree and even land in water in a flooded forest and swim back to a tree and climb back up again. Wow. So it has amazing adaptations to live in the trees, which is different from most tarantulas. So it's really interesting to see that we have two arachnids, two tarantulas, mm -hmm. but they're still very different. Exactly, yeah. Cool. So what else do you have to show us for defense? Uh, yeah. <laughs> do you Everybody's hold, happy today. Do you want to hold the tarantula while we take out another yeah, one? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So this one, is a, this one is one that maybe our guests haven't seen before. Oh, it's fast. She is. She's running. <laughs> she's trying to check out this environment. So what's the name of this one? This is called a vinegaroon, or a whip scorpion. A whip scorpion. It, I can see the resemblance to a scorpion. So I see a lot of legs on that. Um, I think we should ask our students if they think um, this is an insect or not. Maybe if it sits still for a second, we can count the number of legs on it. All right, is this an insect? Yes, no, or you don't know? So if you look closely, you can count one, two, three, four, five, six legs that it's walking on. But it also has this piece in the back, these claws up front, these antenna maybe? So Dan, maybe you can give us some hints. We're uh, we're kind of split 60-40 between is it an insect, yes or no? All right. Most people are saying no. No, I think most people are correct. So this is a, a pretty cool animal. They live in, it's from the US, um, but people aren't that familiar with it because it lives, it's mostly nocturnal and lives under rocks and logs in the desert southwest. Um, and it is an arachnid. It's a different group of arachnids, a relative of a spider um, and the scorpion, but it's not a true scorpion. It doesn't have a venom, it can't sting me. But it has, but it's a bit of a trick question that we ask because it has six walking legs, just like an insect. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. But you can see it using these these uh, antenna form legs up front to find its way around. So these are legs, but they use them like antenna. Arachnids don't have antenna, but it'd been really useful for them to have it if they're a nocturnal animal or living in dark spaces. So this group evolved these antenna form legs to act like antenna. That's so cool. So we're kind of learning about different um, adaptations here, even within the arachnid family. Um, now, I think that you have some insects here that have different colors and warning signals. Can you show us some of those? Sure. I can give you back the rose hair, too, <laughs> although she is very happy. It's a nice I accessory on you. Yeah, I think she's very pleased. Well, she isn't rearing up. Since we have the rose, or flicking. since we have the rose hair here, I can show one warning color on her. So flipping her over, we can get a look at her fangs. Oh, there we go. Bright red. You're right. Yeah, you can see there. So her fangs are right around. She has hairs that are bright red. And she wants to get away there. Let her get away. And so those are. Um, and then when she rears up to show her fangs, she'll she'll have that bright red coloration around it, which says, "Don't mess with me. I'm dangerous. I, you could get hurt." If you uh, if you bite me, kind of like the ones that we see on the screen right, right so now. Right, so you see that's a that's a wasp or the ladybug, which are showing those bright colorations. You don't think of a ladybug as being dangerous, but if you ate it, it would taste horrible. So it's that noxious taste that you're getting from it, or something can sting, or if it uh, or or if it's um, tastes bad, smells bad, or it can hurt you. Like this guy here. If any of our guests have been down to Florida, you might have seen this. And this is a grasshopper, but as you notice, one thing it's not doing, it's not hopping. No. It, it, <laughs> it's staying pretty it, still. It is. So this, this grasshopper no longer is a good jumper, and it can't fly. Um, but you've noticed that it has these bright colorations. It says yellow and the red and black stripes. You think of like those black and yellow stripes like you see on a wasp, and it means I could hurt you. It's dangerous. This can't hurt me unless I were to eat it. If I ate it, it could make me really sick and throw up. Um, so it's poisonous to eat, and that's its defense. And it's 
it's broadcasting that by having these bright colors. Um, so if you can hang out on plants and not be worried by most predators and be um, safe to eat just because so, it's showing that it's that bright color showing that it's it's poisonous. So this kind of has the adaptation of color, whereas maybe some other grasshoppers fly and hopping away is their adaptation to be able to get away from predation. Right. If you ever walk through a field in the summer and you're and you've these grasshoppers will start flying and buzzing away from you as you're walking. They're trying to get away as fast as possible. These guys don't have to do that. They'll just hang out, and you can walk right up to them and grab them because um, they know that, that they, uh, they can make you sick. So do you have any other examples of colors? Oh, oh you can see the bright colors of this guy's wing, too. So oh, it's wow, like showing it's brilliant off that, red. Yeah. So it flashes that wing, so it'll make noise, and it'll flash that wing when it's in danger, and that will make it even uh, um, a, a better shot at it uh, um, getting away or not being preyed upon. So you've showed us a lot of defense yeah. adaptations. We've learned about color. We've learned about rearing up. Yeah. We've learned about flicking hairs, biting. Um, what about feeding? I know that that is a essential part of life. It is. Are there special adaptations for feeding? <laughs> feeding is very important. Um, so there's a number of adaptations you can have for feeding, and this was a good one to show it because, as the book says, this is a very hungry caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> and so caterpillars are very good at eating. This caterpillar, just about three weeks ago, would be about the size of your eyelash or a grain of rice. And three weeks later, it's the size of my pinky. Um, so it's they can they, grow, they eat and eat and eat and grow incredibly fast. So this guy has the type of mouth parts that can clip through um, plants as chewing mouth parts. But in a few weeks, he's going to go through metamorphosis and become an adult moth. And that moth has a long proboscis that it used for feeding from flowers. And so it will be able to get the nectar deep in the flower, where this one doesn't have to worry about that. This one is just sitting on the plants and being able to chew and chew and chew, um, where, the, where, the, uh, um, where the moth is adapted to have that siphoning mouth part. And you can find that with different insects with different mouth parts. You can have a piercing sucking like a mosquito that you showed the picture of earlier. Um, that's going to be able to poke into you and, and then suck out blood. Or a fly who throws up on its food, it does external <laughs> uh, digestion, and then has a specialized mouth part that's like a sponge. And it'll sponge up the throw up digested food and, be, and take that into its body. Wow. So you mentioned that um, this will turn into a moth that actually has that specialized proboscis, mm -hmm. that mouth part, to be able to feed on flowers. That's really important for pollination, isn't it? So are arthropods and pollination, do they go hand in hand? They do. Uh, a lot of arthropods are important pollinators. Um, and a lot of that is through plants and insects or some other arthropods co-evolving over time. Um, so they've evolved mouth parts that fit into the plant, and the plant evolves shapes of their flower to fit those mouth parts. Um, so a lot of times, so specific insects are, are feeding on specific flowers. Um, so you'll have that moth that is feeding in that, uh, um, in that flower, and it can go dip its proboscis in and then get its head down into that flower and get some pollen on it. Then it'll fly over to the other um, flower, put its head down in there, and it'll transfer that pollen from one flower to the other, and allowing that species to be able to continue to plant. And the, and the uh, moth gets a good meal. Cool. Yeah. So monarch butterflies, they're definitely a pollinator and very important for agriculture in that way. But um, I've heard that there are some shifts because of changing climate and habitat that they may not be living in the same kind of ways that they used to. How do arthropods and monarchs adapt to climate change and other impacts that are going on right now. Yeah, there are some challenges that, uh, that humans are imposing on our natural world. Um, and so monarchs can be affected specifically by some changes in the environment from farming to habitat loss and possibly to climate change. And so for having really dry periods, they could be affected by that and not have the resources they need when they're flying on their, um, on their migratory route. And how much of our food actually comes from pollinated plants, so fruits and vegetables that require pollination. It's about a third of our food supply comes from pollinated um, plants. So things like your berries and your nuts are coming from um, pollinated plants where a lot of things like bees and other insects are really important and a lot of them, especially our native pollinators, are in danger. Wow. So we have a student question. Are yep. you ready for sure. it? Okay, this one comes from Casey from Fresno. 
and they want to know, why did you decide to work with insects? Ah, um, I've always loved natural history and I've the natural world and I was out in the woods all the time as a kid. And then when I got to college, I knew I wanted to study biology, but I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. Um, until I took a class freshman year that was called aquatic ecology. And I got to go out into a lake in Michigan and dip a net in that water and pull up super awesome alien creatures, insects, from the bottom of that lake. And I was hooked from that time on. And I knew I didn't just want to study them, but I wanted to share my love of them with everybody too. So everybody liked insects as much as me. <laughs> it seems like you've had a great experience <sighs> with them. And we're lucky to have you as our insect zoo manager, keeping them all alive and healthy. So Leo wants to know, yeah. how long does it take for an insect to evolve a new defense mechanism? Oh, that is a, it, it depends on time. So it's a lot, a lot of time. And so that's things that a lot of the scientists here in this museum are studying on looking at, the, at how long and what process that insects, how long it takes for insects to go through evolution. And it's challenging because insects are sometimes hard to find in the fossil record because they're little and they don't have bones. So it's a challenging, and we sometimes have to look at not the insect, but the effect of the insect. So how it's, how it's maybe chewing on plants. You might find a fossil of a plant that has chew marks in it. And some of our researchers here at the museum do that and be able to tell how the insects are evolving over time. Interesting. Yeah. So this one comes from Traeger Middle School. Okay. And they'd like to know how many known insects are there in the world? That's unknown. <laughs> so we have about a million named insects, um, the ones that have scientific names. It's a thought that there's probably about 10 to even 30 million species of insects um, in the world today. And alive on the planet at this moment, the number that's used is 19 quintillion. Quintillion. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a lot of zeros. <laughs> yeah, I can't even fathom that. Okay, so this one comes from Sean Carlson at Thomas Hunter Middle School in Matthews, Virginia. And do praying mantis eat their young? They can. And so when praying mantises, um, when the young emerge, they scatter. And the parents usually aren't around. So they'll eat anything that is moving. <laughs> so when you have a, oh, here's a, a praying mantis here. This is a gorgeous mantis. That's beautiful. So it's not purposefully going after their young, but it's they're not a, they don't have maternal care. So when if there's a something that looks like food to them, they're going to eat it. So Roosevelt Elementary from North Dakota wants to know, what's your in, favorite insect to learn about? That is a really challenging question because I get to work with so many kinds of insects and I get to work in a museum that has a gigantic collection with amazing researchers. So I get to learn new things all the time. So that, that changes constantly. Do you have anything for our visitors who may have to sign off um, to tell them about how they might learn more about the insects here that they saw today? Well, one way to do it is to uh, come to the Insect Zoo and Live Butterfly Pavilion here at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. So if you're local, come on by for coming on a trip, and you can come visit us and see all the amazing arthropods we have on exhibit. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan. Oh, welcome. So if you missed part of this broadcast or you want to watch it again, it'll be archived later today on curious.si.edu. Thanks for joining us for the webcast and for our special question and answer session. And thank you, Dan, for being here with us Oh, today. thanks for having me. See you next time on Smithsonian Science How.